Benet's Bloody Bits. Hi, my name is Jason Benet, and welcome to Benet's Bloody Bits. The Shining, The Stand, Sleepwalkers, Critters 2, Psycho 4, Quicksilver Highway, Bag of Bones, Riding the Bullet. All those films are directed by Mick Garris. Mick is a writer, producer, director. He's done everything in the genre. And I feel like the high point in his career was producing and directing Masters of Horror, which was an anthology horror series that premiered on Showtime and ran for two seasons. For years, I've wanted to talk to him about the, uh, the show, and he's been kind enough to sit down with me to do an interview, and he definitely gives me more than I bargained for. He's just a wealth of knowledge. So here we are. Here's my interview with Mr. Mick Garris. Okay, Nick, thank you very much for coming on to talk about Masters of Horror. I truly appreciate it. Uh, it's good to see you again, Jason. So what are the Masters of Horror dinners? Uh, what were the Masters of Horror dinners? <laughs> we, we haven't had any since before the uh, pandemic. But basically, it was an opportunity for people who had the same job to get together and just uh, have a good time with one another, get to know each other better, get to know each other at all in the case of people who were not friends before the thing started, but it started way back in the early 2000s um, with uh, a bunch of filmmakers in the genre would get to know each other through film festivals or Directors Guild meetings or conventions or the like, and invariably, talk would turn to, we should all get together and have dinner sometime. And that happened for a couple of years. And I thought, nobody's ever going to do this unless I do. And so I did. And it's kind of an apocryphal story. But um, the uh, I spent about a week trying to get times and a place that would work for enough people to make it worthwhile. So we had a dozen people at our first dinner in the San Fernando Valley, play a place called Cafe Bizu, B-I-Z-O-U, that no longer exists. <clears throat> but um, it was me and Toby Hooper and uh, Guillermo del Toro and Wes Craven and John Carpenter and John Landis and Bill Malone. And there were 12 of us. And it, it was, you know, the cream of the crop. And... Uh, and we got our unofficial name when the people at the table next to us were singing happy birthday to celebrating their friend's birthday at the next table. And after we had joined in singing with them, Guillermo del Toro stood up and said, the masters of horror wish you a happy birthday. And they had <laughs> no idea who was next to them. And to this day, I'm sure they still don't. Did it just work out that all of you guys just happened to have a genre resume just over the years you became friends and connected well, that, that was way? The thing, that was the thing that bound us, yeah. And uh, then people, uh, the next one I had, I set up a couple of months later and it took me one hour to schedule everybody. And then people would start to talk to their friends about it and, hey, can I invite so-and-so? And it's like, look, it's not my dinner, it's our <laughs> dinner. Everybody pays their own way, you know, nobody... It's not one person paying for it, although there are a few who've kind of uh, uh, shuffled under the table who <clears throat> still owe the, owe the pot. But um, but it was uh, it just grew until the last one we did, which was in a tribute to Toby Hooper. So that's how long ago that was. Um, there were thirty five directors there. Wow. So if there had been a bomb dropped on, on that restaurant, never another good horror movie. What I appreciate too about the photos that I've seen of the dinners, uh, I wish I was a fly in the wall because yeah. I'm sure there's amazing stories, uh, no pun intended, that, um, <laughs> <laughs> that you guys kept in house. You know, there's, you all have stories about the crazy world of working in Hollywood. And I appreciate that there were young directors, veterans, you kind of mixed it up. Absolutely. The whole thing was, we're all in this together. We all live in this perceived gutter together, mm -hmm. um, a gutter of disrespect within the mainstream of Hollywood filmmaking. But it wasn't like we were necessarily 
only talking about making horror movies. It was just a bunch of people together who liked each other and had conversations. Yes, we would talk about making our movies, but we would talk about other things too. You know, we would we would discuss politics and just things that were going on in the world or things that were going on in our lives or did you see this movie wasn't this funny um you know it was just like a group of any like-minded individuals getting together for a social event so how does the masters of horror dinners become masters of the horror series um it wasn't a very difficult jump uh, not a tough leap to go from the dinners to the the series because almost everyone was was saying wouldn't it be great <clears throat> if there was a way to be the masters of our own fate to not have to be you know john carpenter george romero all these people who'd just been beaten down by the studio system you know the freedom they had in in their independent filmmaking that they never had again since the 70s <clears throat> you know uh wouldn't it be great if we could be in control of that and i gave it a form i basically thought of the idea let's do an hourly tv series and promise them the masters of horror but you have to promise us non-interference so um we took it to, well, first of all, everybody kind of agreed to do it. it. They signed a paper that said, if I'm available when this comes up, I agree to participate in this show. Uh, otherwise, it was the the uh, chicken and the egg, you know, you, can we make the show? Yes, but no, nobody's available. So, um, so we had that agreement went to three different companies. The first place we went to was Anchor Bay, and then there were two others. All of them wanted to do it, but in the room with Anchor Bay, they said, how much and when can we start? They bought it like that. Wow. And the, the only experience even remotely like that I've ever had in my career. So, so you're one of the you know, 13 episodes a season. You're one of the directors. Did you have a list of the other 12 that you wanted to fill in or was it just a matter of availability? It was availability and, you know, a, a lot of the people who I knew the best, but also people I really wanted to be a part of it. You know, I was close with Toby Hooper and I was close with John Carpenter and John Landis and, and so many of those people and Joe Dante that I knew would be great um, and had not had the opportunity to be great for a while. And I knew of other people. I, I didn't know. I'd met Dario Argento years ago, but there's no way he would have remembered me. I didn't know him. Takashi Miike, uh, I loved Audition so much, but I certainly never knew him. And he did not speak English anyway. Um, so there was no way for us to have had a relationship before that. But we wanted it to be a mix and not just of masters of horror here in the States, but internationally as well. So uh, we shot them all in Vancouver, in and around Vancouver. But um, it, it was really, we wanted to, we promised the biggest names in the genre. And, uh, you know, if we were not able to deliver that, they would not have financed the show. And I'm assuming you went to Canada because it was cheaper for tax breaks? Completely, yeah. The tax breaks and numerous other uh, factors that led to it being uh, produced on a on a lower budget, but it also has a really good filmmaking foundation there. Um, there are layers of good crew people. There's layers of good cast, good actors, good technicians, people who work on the highest end stuff from the U.S. and from Canada, but. Um, yeah, I would love to have made it in L.A., but it would have probably been 30% more expensive. How excited were all of you that you're on a cable station? So there's limits, but you could kind of go a little bit more crazy with the gore, the violence, sex, nudity, kind of the pillars of exploitation. Well, that's why the people who normally never did television were agreeable to do it, because not only was it for Showtime, which was a pay TV network uh, on cable, um, even Showtime had to say, no, we won't impose 
our rules. We had, we had five basic rules. I don't even remember what they were specifically, but no killing children, no male genitalia. Uh, you know, th there were five things that nobody really minded uh, not doing anyway. Um, but uh, other than that, they didn't pay enough to have creative rights and could not say, here's our notes for the latest episode. And it's like, um, you know what you can do with your notes? <laughs> so we never had to we never had to deal with that because the agreement was was such that if you want the masters of horror, you have to give them their head. And and basically that was the promise that we made these filmmakers and that I was there to protect as the producer on the show. What made you decide that your first episode was going to be chocolate? It was something I'd been wanting to make as a feature for years, and I'd gotten really close a couple of times. There were various versions of it. It started out as a short story, and then it was a script called Double Vision that became so close to getting made two or three times. And finally, when it was, look, this show is about doing stories that you want to do rather than ones you're assigned to do. It was something I thought, this is a really strong story. It definitely broadens the scope of what horror means. It doesn't have monsters in it. There are murders and there is a touch of the supernatural to it. But um, it was a story I really wanted to tell and something that I thought could work really well and not be like any of the other stories that we did. And that's kind of what everybody did. All of the filmmakers said, like Joe Dante, when he did... Um, the zombie one. Uh, homecoming. Yeah, Homecoming, which, you know, I was at a film festival in Italy where that played and got a 10-minute standing ovation. You know, Joe couldn't make that as a movie anywhere. It was the first movie to take on the Iraq War and be critical of our government. You know, people forget because everybody started taking that position. But creatives... There was nothing on TV or in the movies that was critical of the Iraq war until homecoming. So it was really a remarkable thing that Joe had really wanted to do. And with Screwfly Solution before, Joe wanted to do um, Screwfly Solution first. And we had a conversation and felt that homecoming would be even better to start with. <clears throat> and then if we get a second season, then let's revisit Screwfly Solution. But, um, you know, everybody had stories that they wanted to do or were open to looking at new material. Carpenter didn't bring us material, but we gave him stuff to look at. And that's when he read Cigarette Burns and said, I'd love to do this. And Drew and Scott at the time had, had done that. They worked so, together so well that uh, they did the second season one with Carpenter as well. Can you talk about the sexuality of chocolate and actually a lot of your work? I mean, you have this guy played by Henry Thomas that could feel what this woman's feeling, even down to an orgasm, which, sorry, guys, theirs are better than ours because they have multiple <laughs> and we have one and done. Can you talk about how that kind of has made its way through a lot of your work? Well, a lot of my fiction, you know, m most of the stuff I've done for films and television has either been existing material or written by other people or, you know, is much more mainstream that can carry the load of the sexuality. If you've read my books or see the the original things that I've done, um, Chocolate being probably the most overt of them, although a new script I've just finished is very erotic as well and will be a tough sell. Um, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> the idea of, of my horror story was that here's this traditional heterosexual man who's just gone through a divorce, <clears throat> experiencing not only the feelings in the heart that a woman has when she's in love, but the feelings of her body. So it's not like he's experiencing being anally penetrated. He's experiencing being vaginally penetrated, something entirely different. And it's very much important to the story. That is what the story is about, is about a guy becoming a better man by experiencing uh, being a woman from uh, this point of view, not becoming one, but experiencing one. 
And it turns out that she's not such a wonderful human being anyway. <laughs> but the sexuality is something that you can't do on television and you can't do in most movies either. And erotic thrillers were really big in the 80s and early 90s, but they've died out. And, the, you know, right now, um, you know, Ethan Cohen's new movie uh, goes there with the erotic elements of it. Um, and uh, um, what's the new one by the uh, St. Maud director, Rose? Um, oh, I'm forgetting the title as well, but I've seen it. Yeah, it's a title of uh, oh, Love Lives Bleeding, yeah, uh, which I haven't seen yet, but I'm seeing tomorrow uh, that I hear is not just described as a sexual movie, but a horny movie. So um, <laughs> That's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, movies got timid, and fiction, even mainstream horror fiction has gotten very timid in terms of sexuality. And you know, Chocolate was written as a short story and first published uh, 12 years before we did Masters of Horror. And it took me that long to turn it into a film. And it had to be for a show that had no limits, that was um, hands off. But even then, finding sensuality and sexuality in film and television was was rough to do. People were very skittish about it. And there was so much backlash by the mainstream and the right wing, you know, becoming so much more prominent and prevalent in our society. And, you know, th them pissing on everything that, that was taking place, whether it was social justice or entertainment, you know, that was a battle that had to be had. And it, in terms of sexuality, they were prim and proper to the point of boycotts if they, if any advertisers or networks who would carry something that would be over the top in their opinion. So you went from chocolate in season one to a Clyde Barker story, Valerie yeah. on the stairs, and you had worked together. Obviously you're a good friend. You worked together on Quicksilver Highway. How did you approach, you know, season two? Did you go for it more or? Yeah, well, that also is a sexual story, but not as explicitly sexual. There's nudity and there's sexuality in it. But Clive and I had also worked together on, I had adapted In the Flesh for Warner Brothers as a feature that I was going to direct that never got made. Um, there was a, a pilot that we wrote together called Spirit City USA for ABC years ago that I was going to direct that never got made. Um, we wrote a pilot for Shudder last year um, for an anthology series, and and Shudder, I think, is in a bit of financial distress, and that didn't get made, uh, but we were very excited to work together. And I did pay attention to the fact that a lot of people did not consider Chocolate to be a horror story. And mm -hmm. so I thought, okay, I'm going to give you a horror story, and it's going to have a monster in it too. <laughs> and so I uh, decided to just go in a t totally other direction. And uh, and also I wanted to bring Clive into it. We brought him in on the first season with an adaptation of one of his stories that was done, Heckle's Tale. But um, uh, with uh, Valerie on the Stairs, it had never been published as a short story. It was written as a treatment that for a movie that never got made. And so it was an original story for Masters by Clive that was really exciting to delve into. Now, if we'd followed the entire treatment, I'd still be shooting because <laughs> it went on and on and on. But, but it was something I was really, I'd ask Clive because I'd ask, um, uh, ask him about doing something the first season that if there was something we could do in the second season that I would direct this time instead of John McNaughton. Um, and so that's what he came up with. And I loved it. And you got to work with Candyman himself, Tony Todd in full makeup. How was that experience? Tony Todd in full makeup uh, in Vancouver when it got really cold. <laughs> uh, my experience working with Tony was great. His was probably not as great in full makeup and and dealing with cold 
sound stages that are really warehouses that are impossible to fully heat in the <laughs> middle of winter in Vancouver, in British Columbia. But actually, no, we we became very good friends. We both have the same birthday, not the same year, but close. And uh, um, our birthdays are the same day. We worked together again in a, a TV series that I did a couple episodes of. Uh, and we got to be good friends. And, and I love Tony. And working with him and with Christopher Lloyd for like the third time. Um, we had worked together. I'd written um, the episode of Amazing Stories that Bob Zemeckis directed that Chris was in called Go to the Head of the Class. And then we had done Quicksilver Highway together. And then, you know, he had forgotten that I was the guy who did those things when we got together and did Valerie on the Stairs. But uh, he was so great in that. And it was a much more dramatic role for him than a comedic one, too. Just before I forget, Go to the Head of the Class is one of my favorite episodes of Amazing Stories. I remember it was one of the few that was an hour long. Yeah. Spielberg, Steven Spielberg's uh, pilot episode, The Mission, was also an hour. Yeah. I share my birthday is April 18th, uh -huh. 1971. Eli Roth's birthday is April 18th, 1972. Wow. <laughs> and, and Edgar Wright is also an April 18th uh, birthday person. So I, it's, it's kind of cool that, you know, that those lined up like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Tony and I are December 4th. Yeah. As is Jeff Bridges, as is uh, several other. <laughs> so with Valerie, maybe I'm reaching on this. You have an African-American man playing a, in Black Demon. And then the, the uh, a white lady is the lead. Was there any hint at? interracial relationship or is that just something i never even thought i never even yeah. thought about race i thought about who's the best actor for this and someone who was experienced in working in makeup as tony was but um the power of tony todd he's quite imposing he's several inches taller than me um okay. and can be very intimidating and imposing and when you have someone who's not nearly as sizable as the male lead who has to confront him, you know, you want there to be a massive difference between them physically. So race never even came to mind, but uh, until after it was done and then realizing, oh, well, this is just like in uh, with George Romero and Night of the Living Dead, he cast the best actor for the for the role never even thinking about it and then realizing, wow, this is really about um, racial and ethnic striving in, in the United States. And Tony Todd played the, the role in the Night of the Living Dead remake in 1990. That's right. So that's things, right. Kind of come, things come full circle. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So basically Showtime said you guys had carte blanche to do what you want, but obviously they've never heard of Takashi Miike. They've never seen Audition or Ichi the Killer. 26 episodes over two seasons and only one never aired. What did they think of when they saw Imprint? They flipped out. Um, you know, it didn't, when Showtime saw it, um, they just said, there's no way we can air this, no matter what you do to it. And I wasn't going to go to Takashi, uh, to Mike-san and say, we need to cut this, this, and this. Because that went up against the grain of what the show was about. But I found out later that he he told me, we'd have made cuts. I wanted to have my film on American TV, but it was still a bad precedent to set for all the other filmmakers involved. Um, we did not break any of the five Showtime rules that they gave us beforehand. <laughs> but what happened was they say the overall intensity is so great that we just don't want to air it at all. We're not asking for cuts. We're not asking for changes. We just don't want to air it. So in some ways, we were thinking, this is great. It'll go out direct to DVD as the one Showtime was not able to air that was too chicken shit to air. <laughs> and so we thought it would really sell a lot. Well, at that time, Walmart sold 40% of all DVDs sold in America. Wow. Walmart found out about it. And so Walmart would not carry it. 
We did go behind their backs when we released the box set, though, the crypt set that had all 13 episodes. They didn't notice. So they were selling the box set without realizing uh, what what was in it. Well, their five golden rules obviously didn't involve uh, thinking about it now makes me, you know, cringe is the the needles under the fingernails into the gum. And throwing aborted fetuses into the river. <laughs> and the nails and gum thing is not done in five seconds. The camera just stays no. with it. So it's hard to rewatch, but at one moment, it's absolutely beautiful. The cinematography, the lighting, the color, and then it's contrasted with this repellent violence. But if you know Mike, this is par for the course. It is what to expect. And you know, I, I'm squeamish to some things, you know, but it's not Mick Garris's Masters of Horror. It's the Masters of Horror. It wasn't meant for my sensibilities. Nobody had to think, will Mick like this or not? That's not what the show was ever about. And I'll tell you, there's a theatrical version that is eight minutes longer that was released in Japan, and they cut it down to an hour from 68 minutes because that was our time limit. Our show had to be an hour or under, um, but not too much under. And so the other eight minutes, it's all in that scene. So it's all in the torture scene, which for me, you know, Miike said through his interpreter, look, the more she's tortured, the more we feel for her. Mm. And I think that's true to an extent, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I am not here to impose my viewpoint on Takashi Miiki. I'm here to act as his protector and his defender and allow him to make the movie that he wants to make. So it eventually got out there, and the, the places that carry Masters of Horror now have no problem showing it on Tubi or whatever other um, uh, outlets it, it's streaming on. But... Um, at that time, it was it was a rough one, and it's still hard for me to watch. It is beautiful filmmaking, but it is brutal. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to see it till the DVD came out. I still own it to this day. It's one I don't revisit often, not because it's not good, but it's just he truly did his job. I don't know if he was being competitive, like, oh, Dario Argento's here, John Carpenter's <laughs> here. I'm going to take it to the next level, or was Mike just being Mike? Mike was being Mike. It was a story that he loved that was written by the same guy who wrote the book Audition. But I think there was more competitive spirit here in the States because we were editing in LA and there were always three editors working at a time. So there were three shows being worked on at a time. And we would go into each other's editing room and look and go, oh, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> wait, that's scarier than mine, or that's uh, more intense than mine. Uh, but that sense of competition was really wonderful. I knew, uh, for example, when I was cutting chocolate, I knew it was a horror story. A lot of people said, no, this is an erotic thriller. No, this is a horror story. And then I would show, like John Landis would come into the editing room and I'd show him that scene you were talking about where Henry Thomas experiences what being fucked and <laughs> Landis it freaked him out and it's go, oh 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 and it's like okay it's a horror story <laughs> were there any directors that you tried to get and just it didn't work out they obviously oh, Romero yeah. didn't get to direct or Clyde yeah. Barker or well uh, both of them we wanted we wanted Sam Raimi weren't able to get him with Romero it was a scheduling thing because he was going to do Heckle's Tale, and in fact, it says George A. Romero presents Heckle's mm -hmm. Tale on the Masters of Horror uh, disc and uh, when you see it on television. Um, and uh, um, Guillermo, I wanted Guillermo to do one, and we thought we were going to be able to get him. Uh, and Wes was going to do one as well. But it's a matter of timing, because once the train is out of the station, every 10 days a new show had to start shooting so every two weeks so you're signing up for a schedule as much as you are for a movie so if you couldn't if your car didn't fit the train at a very specific point in time then it just wouldn't work out um, we just couldn't stop 
and wait for somebody to become available to be able to do it. So the train goes down the hill and there's no putting up, uh, uh, putting on brakes until after you've reached the bottom. And I'm, I'm sure David Cronenberg's another one, just with the timing. Absolutely. Yeah. And frankly, he doesn't like to think of himself as a horror director. And so, uh, you know, I, I, he actually did turn it down. Oh. Yeah. It would have been great to have him. You know, I've known him forever. I did publicity on scanners back in 81. So, uh, and did the making of Videodrome and uh, wrote Fly 2 at his recommendation. But uh, it just, he, he did not want to be considered a horror director. I still remember the interview you did. It might have been for the Z channel. It was you, David Cronenberg, John Landis, John Carpenter, completely different personalities all in the same room. So you interviewing people goes back a long time. Goes back even before that. But that was actually done when I was doing publicity for Universal. All of them had Universal horror movies coming out that year um, in 81 or 82. Uh, but... I go, my interviewing goes back to high school. My first interview was Ray Bradbury and my second was Rod Serling. And then I got into music journalism and I interviewed Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and uh, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of dead rock stars as well as living ones. But yeah, I've always been curious uh, about how people do people that I admire, how they do what they do. And, and, and get some insight into that. It, I've just always been curious. There's not many people on this planet, living or dead, that could say they interviewed those people. That's, imp you know, it's impressive. Rod Serling, I mean, what a legacy, Night Gallery, Twilight Zone. That You must have just amazing memories of those, sitting down with those people. I'm assuming in person, right? Because the technology wasn't there to do, you know, what we do no. now. No, this was, you know, I was in, in high school, so this was in 1969. And, uh, you know, uh, we didn't record them on video, although it was done on the, on the stage at the local community college after both of them had spoken. Uh, entirely different uh, times. But uh, I was this huge fan, and I wrote for my high school newspaper and then created... When I was 18, I created my own magazine called Arthur the Magazine, where it was an arts magazine that would reviews and interviews and poetry and fiction and all kinds of things that that was just, um, I was into the arts all my life. It's interesting. I have a lot of discussions with horror fans and Dario Argento's name will come up or John Carpenter or Stuart Gordon, these different directors. And they're always like, man, I really miss their stuff from the 80s, early 90s. And I always point them back to Masters of Horror. I'm like, okay, they might say, well, post-opera, Dario's kind of hit or miss. They might have a point here or there. I'm like, have you seen Pelts? Yeah. Have you seen Jennifer? And they either don't remember it or they've never watched it. I'm like, Stuart Gordon, did you see Dreams in the Witch House? Or Jeffrey Combs as Edgar Allan Poe in The Black Cat? And I'm like, you guys... Now, I'm an older guy, too, and I grew up with these films, but I think there's a – to accept newer stuff, sometimes people need to be nudged a little bit. And yeah, always, especially when it's a TV show, you know. Um, and it was on Showtime. It wasn't on Netflix. It wasn't on ABC. It wasn't on uh, a widely seen network. You know, HBO had 10 times the audience that Showtime had at that time. But um, – you know, it, it's out there, but it was from 2005 to 2007 is when we made it and when it aired. But it really was taking the shackles off of people who were kind of cynical about the film business because of how it had kicked their balls so much. You know, Carpenter was ready to retire and ready to give up. And when I talked to him about doing this, he goes, yeah, yeah, I, that sounds like fun. When we were shooting and he's going, yeah, yeah, this piece of shit, it'll be fine. It'll come out fine. <laughs> you know, just being very guarded about it all. Yeah. But then it became the most popular episode of the series. When I asked him to do season two, he said, yeah, you know, I think I'd like to do that. But it is something where they got an opportunity that they hadn't had for years, if not decades, if at all. And, uh, 
Dario really firing on all cylinders. You know, uh, Jennifer was so much uh, a crowd favorite, but the second one was even more Dario's cinematic style. You know, I think the photography and the use of color and all that 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 he was famous for in his feature films was even more at play in Pelts, although Jennifer definitely gets into, as you were talking about, the erotic horror mm -hmm. elements that this show allowed itself to go for. I felt Pelts was very gialli, and I'm going to look at the camera people. The Carpenter episode we're talking about is Cigarette Burns. Yeah. That's probably top three for most people and probably the best thing he's done since The Thing, not to say in the mouth of madness and all these other films aren't great, but cigarette burns was definitely top tier for most people that saw it. It's way up there. And I really like pro life too. I thought he did an amazing job with that. And it was again, the same writers. Yes. Now for a makeup effects, was that mostly, you know, KNB? It, it was entirely KNB, but they, uh, Howard Berger was there for the whole show. Um, but they had to work with local Canadian people as well as, um, well, Howard. I think there was one or two other Americans who were up there in Vancouver as well. But yeah, everything was done under the aegis of KNB other than the two Japanese films. Let me see if I can remember the initials. K, Robert Kurtzman, yeah. N, Greg Nicotero, B, Howard Berger. Right. And Kurtzman has not been a part of them for 30 years because he left to become a director, whereas Greg became a director and producer without leaving. So, I, you know, unfortunately, some of your good friends have since passed since yeah. Masters of Horror. I can't go without talking about Larry Cohen, yeah. Toby Hooper, and Stuart Gordon. Can you talk about them not as filmmakers, but as your friend? Well... All of them were people I knew before. I met Larry when I interviewed him for Cine Fantastique right after uh, I saw um, uh, God Told Me To. And we became friends after that, really. Uh, Larry was a stand-up comedian before he became a filmmaker. And really funny, really, you, you'd love to be around him. He was... He was a Catskills comedian, you know, in, in, in the Jewish resorts back in the 50s and 60s before he turned to making movies. And then, you know, he kind of solidified the, his genre cred with It's Alive and then never left it again. But really so funny and so dry and <laughs> always had jokes on hand. Um, but you'd never guess what an original thinker he was, you know, his jokes could be great or they could be corny, but you'd see something like God told me to, and go, this is freaking brilliant. This is, you know, this came from a Catskills comedian, you know, but, yeah. um, but he was such a good writer. And during his career, he, he sold so many scripts for a million dollars or more. He would just write a script somebody'd buy it for a million bucks, write a script, somebody buy it for a million bucks, phone booth, million bucks, you know, even for low budget films. Um, and just a, a really wonderful guy. And one thing you can say about all of them is they all had a great sense of humor. But Stuart Gordon had a very <laughs> impish sense of humor. You couldn't tell if he was messing with you or if he was telling the truth. And I didn't know him that well when we were making um, the Black Cat. And well, I, I knew him much better then because it was the second season. But he's saying in the script, a cat's eye is cut out. And he said, well, you know, we just get a cat from the pound and then we cut its eye out. And he said, Stuart, no, we don't. I'm, I'm a vegetarian. I'm a member of PETA. <laughs> there's no way there's going to. And you know, to this day, I know he was messing with me, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but he was really funny, really smart, avuncular. He was the Santa Claus of horror. His movies could be so dark and so serious. And he was just this really 
happy guy who loved his food. He'd love to discover restaurants in Vancouver or wherever we happen to be on the planet, you know, whether it was at a festival in Spain or wherever, discovering a new restaurant uh, was thing, is something that would always be exciting to him. Just a wonderful guy. And Toby was a totally unique guy, completely in opposition to what the, the viciousness of his films, a sweetheart, a pussycat, a teddy bear. And and he kind of had a stutter, you know, yeah, you, you know, Mick, ah, 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 <laughs> a bit, and and you just wanted to hug him. But he had this ferociously original mind, and very well educated on cinema, not just horror cinema, but art house cinema, international cinema. Really, really well educated in all of all of the the history of film and the international history of film and filmmakers, but a sweeter guy you could not spend time with. He he and I were very close, maybe closer than any of the other filmmakers that I knew through Masters of Horror. I got Stuart here. You know, I have uh, From Beyond here. I have dolls yeah. hanging at the bottom here. And I'm going to look at the camera, folks. Toby Hooper directed Poltergeist. Just putting that yep, out there. That's he right. Toby Hooper directed favorite. Yeah, yeah, I was there. I was there. I can tell you. Oh, you were on set quite a bit, or I did publicity on Poltergeist, and I helped do the making of Poltergeist. I interviewed Spielberg for the making of Poltergeist documentary. But you know, Stephen was my first boss. He's the first guy to hire me as a screenwriter on Amazing Stories. But I was on the set of Poltergeist, and yes, Spielberg wrote the shooting script for Poltergeist. He was on the set every day. He was a very strong producer, but Toby did all of the pre-production. Toby was on the set. He was the one calling action and cut. Steven was very involved all day long on the set as a very strong producer with a director doing his first studio movie uh, who was glad to have him there. So it is a movie directed by Toby Hooper and strongly produced by Steven Spielberg, who, of course, is going to leave his stamp on something he was creatively involved in. But I watched it happen. And, you know, it it's a, a very strong producer and a new director getting his first opportunity to do a studio film. And so you're always going to be a little more hesitant to speak your mind in front of everybody when the most successful filmmaker in the world is on the floor next to you. But it's it was very much a collaboration. And in fact, when I worked on the others as a uh, supervising producer, the series that was produced by Amblin and really produced by Spielberg, though his name isn't on it, I suggested, I was responsible for hiring many of the directors. And I suggested Toby Hooper to Spielberg. And Spielberg said, that's a great idea. I'd love to work with Toby again. And it was great to bring them back together after doing the Taken miniseries, which came after after Poltergeist as well. So. Yeah, there was no falling out. I mean, Toby directed the final episode of Amazing Stories, Miss Stardust, with where yeah. he ended it. And yep. an episode of Taken many years later. So, folks, I think Mick has put that rumor <laughs> to bed right there. Yeah. I don't think I've actually heard all these stories. So, yeah. Toby directed there. Poltergeist with a lot of input from a very strong producer who anyone who isn't a fool would welcome input from. So, Masters of Horror runs for two seasons. Yeah. Then in the summer of 2008, NBC premieres a show called Fear Itself, yep. 13 one-hour movies with directors with a genre pedigree. Is Fear Itself the unofficial third season of Masters of Horror? Well, it says created by Mick Garris. Um, I was the producer on it. There was a Writers Guild strike that was fast approaching when we were developing the scripts. We had first drafts written for all 13 episodes delivered by, it was Halloween in 2007, 2007, 2008, I'm, I'm not sure which. Um, and then they said, okay, for the rewriting, we are bringing in non-union writers from Canada. 
during the strike so we can get away with it. And I said, no, there's no way. If you do that, I'm leaving the show. Mm. And they said, well, no, you can be producer and just tell them what to write. Give them your notes and tell them what to write. And I said, that's, I'm a writer and I'm on strike and I support the strike and I can't do this. Um, and so it was the most difficult thing in the world to do in my career was to leave my baby that I created and had so much success with on Showtime. And so they basically kidnapped and raped my baby. Um, mm -hmm. So everything that Masters of Horror stood for, freedom for the director to tell the story he wanted, he or she wanted, um, no censorship, None of that, would, you couldn't do that on NBC. You just could not. So there were a couple filmmakers, particularly Stuart Gordon said, well, remember Twilight Zone was able to do a good job. Outer Limits was able to do it well. We can do that. And he talked me into agreeing to do the show in the first place. But once the strike happened and they kept going with non-union writers that did a terrible job in my opinion, um, I just said, I, I can't be a part of this. And I had to leave the show and I, I quit the show and did not work on it after all of the first drafts had been delivered. So painful, difficult decision. I gave up a lot creatively and financially, um, but I couldn't in good, in good faith stick around for them fucking up the show. And to this day, I've not seen all of them. And they never aired some of them because, well, this is something, one of the happy things that uh, I can look back on is Masters of Horror was the number two show on Showtime and uh, Fear Itself got pulled after five episodes uh, of the eight that they made. So, Well, I don't know what they were thinking. I remember because it's in the promo trailer that the first episode dropped on June 5th on NBC. This is the summer of 2008. NBC, NBC. Right. The, the, the Summer Olympics were going to air in July. So most of the episodes didn't air. And what happened was I was actually watching the show. I don't know, five, six, seven episodes in. They stopped. They never aired on television. I didn't get to watch them until the flimsy box set from Lionsgate came out with all 13 episodes. So I don't know what they were thinking. They must have just didn't care because they just, the Olympics, nobody's going to want to. What were you thinking with that scheduling? Yeah, I I don't even know what happened to it beyond there. But yeah, they, did they make 13? I didn't realize they made 13. So I guess, yeah, they aired eight of them and never aired the last five or something like that. But I haven't seen several of them. I just, it's too painful for me. And, you know, I thought Stewart's was great. I thought it was really good under the circumstances of having network uh, interference censorship and advertiser interference. Um, he was able to pull something off really well, but what most of what I saw was such a crashing disappointment considering what it could have been and what we'd done the first two seasons. But <clears throat> I'd rather celebrate the two seasons of Masters of Horror than mourn what could have come after. Because how often do you get a chance for even to do one season of groundbreaking television? Do you feel like Nightmare Cinema, which you were a part of as a, a director, is more of an extension of Masters of Horror than Fear Itself was? Oh, absolutely. I was uh, the producer of Nightmare Cinema as well, and I put it together originally intending it to be a, feature, uh, a TV series that each of them would shoot in a different country. So I wanted it to be international masters of horror, uh, but nobody else had that kind of imagination or willingness to gamble on something like that. So eventually it shrunk down in size and we shot it all in LA on the low budget agreement to, with all the unions. And I had even though they lived in this country, I had a British director, I had a Japanese director, I had a Cuban director, and then two token uh, Anglos, me and Joe Dante <laughs> and that. But yeah, that was something that I put together with the same philosophy as Masters of Horror. 
which is available. I believe it was on Shutter. It's on Blu-ray and DVD. Yeah. I feel like it, people need to go look for it. I don't know if everybody's got a chance to see it, and it's been out for a while now. Yeah, it was um, <clears throat> at a, at the lowest budget I've ever worked on, although it doesn't look like it. Um, but uh, it was released very, very poorly um, and only in three cities theatrically in like one or two theaters in each of those cities. Um, and it was, it was very disappointingly handled. Um, and, uh, but at least we made it and at least it got out there and, and you can, you can find it out there and it's, it's a lot better movie than anybody expects it to be. Yeah. I, I'm really proud of that little film. I feel like nightmare cinema is right for a re-release by one of the boutique companies because there are no extra features on that film and it's a newer film. I'm sure there's diaries and behind the scenes journals and trailers and you could do audio commentaries. It's a missed opportunity not to, you know, somebody can come along and maybe get the rights to it and, and do it right. Yeah. Here's hoping Scream Factory or one of the other companies would do it. But so far that hasn't happened. I know Cinedime, uh, they put out the Blu-ray, but with no fanfare, no extras, no nothing. So it's the movie that uh, has to stand on its own. So post-mortem, your award-winning podcast <laughs> ran for many years, but you decided to hang Seven up. Seven years, your, yeah. You, hung, you decided to hang up your hat. What memories do you have of those seven years, and why did you decide to, to end it? Well, it was really great. I never set out to do a podcast. It was like Podcast One is the biggest podcasting company in the world. And producer Joe Russo was at a party with one of their employees. And they talked about the idea of me doing an interview show because I have a history of having done the FearNet show, Fear Itself. Um, uh, no, um, uh, Postmortem, the TV show. Um, and so they called me in to do a meeting with the head of the company, a guy named Norm Pattis, who had sold Westwood One for $100 million or something. They were one of the biggest uh, radio syndicators. And so he opened Podcast One. And he's pitching me saying, Adam Carolla makes $7.5 million a year on his podcast for us, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, great. And we started doing it. And I knew I could get people nobody else could get for conversations. And it would be unique in that it would be filmmaker to filmmaker podcast interviews rather than journalist to filmmaker or you know, fanboy to filmmaker or that sort of thing. Um, and, and I had the greatest time. But after 10 months, I realized that Podcast One was not the most compatible home for us. And over that time, I got the grand sum of $500. So you podcast for the love of it, not to become wealthy. Uh, and then we made the move to Fangoria, and, uh, or did we go to Blumhouse from there? Uh, but we went to Blumhouse, we went to Fangoria, and ended up on D Dread Central. And I had the best time doing it. There's not a show that I didn't learn something from. Uh, uh, it was great conversations, but after seven years, I just realized mission accomplished. For the last three years, I would drive producer Joe crazy saying, this is our last year. <laughs> because it was, who have we not gotten? The whole point of this show is we talk to people that nobody else is able to get. We have conversations that people want to hear with people like Stephen King and Clive Barker and Quentin Tarantino and you know James Wan and Quentin did our last two one-on-one -on -one shows. And after that, it was like mission accomplished. I would love to have gotten you know Spielberg and Sam Raimi on. I tried and kept trying, but the timing would never work out. They're both always working. And uh, I just felt like I don't want to be doing and we did several of them who were great filmmakers, but I don't necessarily want the show to become interviews of first time directors doing Shutter originals. You know, we, we've done that and people who really deserve the attention and people who I admired a lot, but 
that's not what the point of the show was. The point of the show was people either I knew or had access to or were willing to have conversations where we could really open up and they'd feel comfortable talking in ways that they would not on television or on other podcasts or on radio or whatever. But we just have a, a real honest one-on-one -on -one conversation between filmmakers. And uh, like I said, after, after seven years, it was definitely time to say mission accomplished because uh, of the people we wanted to get, it didn't look like anyone. We'd talked to all of them, and the ones we hadn't talked to, we probably would not be able to get access to. So we went out in style. Um, the people at Beyond Fest and the American Cinematheque they had us do our final show live at the Cinematheque, at the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, sold out audience of over 500 people. And then me and five other filmmakers uh, sitting on the dais, having conversation about the genre, about the state of affairs, had wonderful video tributes from people like Stephen King and Clive Barker and, and lots of really wonderful people. Um, and so it was like, if we can go out like that, that's the way to go out. <laughs> so you go out on the high at this peak, Mick Garris as the film writer, producer, director, are you setting off in the sunset or is there more to come from you? Oh God, no, no, no. Well, you know, and that's one of the reasons too, is I didn't want the podcast to be my primary focus. My primary focus is as a filmmaker. Two days after that final podcast, I sat down, started a new script, which I finished three weeks later. That I've I've done a couple of polishes on now, and it's 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 going out to people right now, and we'll we'll see what happens. It's a very different uh, endeavor than than what you might imagine is a Mick Garris movie, but we'll see. Mick, thank you very much. It's been an honor and a privilege for you spending part of your day with me. I. Thank you for all the work you've done over the years and how you've championed the genre and the fans and the filmmakers. It's all appreciated. Uh, thank you. And the same to you, Jason. Always good to see you. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. You too.